Well, believe it or not, it is only three weeks till Christmas. Yay! Three weeks till Christmas. Are you excited? I'm excited. We should be excited. And, and the children and maybe some of the adults too will be running around the, and, and, and writing their lists and thinking about all the things that they might get at Christmas or the things that they need. And most of us will hear something along those lines at some point, I'm pretty sure, uh, whether we'll say them ourselves maybe. I need this. I need this. Maybe you'll hear someone say, I need Poe Dameron's X-Wing in Lego. I need an Xbox One. I need FIFA 17. (laughs) What do we need? What is it for you? Whether it's a, a Christmas present or not, I don't know. I'm pretty sure that most of us at some point will either hear something like that or even think it or say it ourselves. For me, I'm thinking, it's Christmas. I'm going to need a rest. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I need Middlesbrough Football Club to pick up a few more points over this busy time. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you're thinking, I need a drink. I need to stop taking those drugs. I need to get better. I need a healthy body. I need my diseases to go. I need money to cover the cost that I've spent out this Christmas. Maybe you're a young mum and you think, I I need a standby button for my kids so I can just shut them down for an hour. I need someone to love me, someone to care for me. I need work. I need my college teacher to phone in sick tomorrow. I wonder how you'd answer that question. What do you need? Well, that that, that may be you or me personally, but what about us as a church? What does Worthing Tabernacle need? And I I know that that most of us here love this church and we think about this sort of thing all the time and uh, and discuss it together and that's good, that's healthy because we want the best for our church. And we think, uh, uh, the tab needs this. The tab needs to stop doing that. We need more money. We need to be more informal. We need to be more formal. We need more younger people. We need more older people. We need this. We need that. And what we've got here in Revelation is we've got seven letters written to seven churches. And each church has stuff that's going on. Each church has its needs. Some of them are good needs, some of them are bad needs. But they all need one thing. And it's not a thing. What every church needs is a person. They need Jesus. Because if you've got Jesus, there's not going to be a cold heart in sight. If you've got Jesus and you're suffering persecution, it's different with him with you. Churches need Jesus. That is what is so clear about every single one of these letters. Seven letters written to seven churches with needs, with hardship, with discipline issues, with laziness, with fearfulness. Churches with all kinds of problems. But what each one needs and what each church gets is Jesus. Isn't it? Each letter opens with that. Whether it's a good church or a bad church, Jesus gives them something of himself. I've got a word for you, church. I've got something to say. Now, if you're a Christian here this morning and you, you, you know me, you're probably thinking, well, I know what he's going to say when he says, what do we need? Yeah? He's going to say, Jesus. Good. But maybe some of you are thinking... Ah, Rich, so predictable. I know, I know, I've been a Christian for 20 years. Tell me something I don't know for once. No. If these seven churches represent the fullness of all churches everywhere in all time and place, that includes us. And no matter what you think you need or what you think you know we need, how long you've been a Christian and what you know about that, I don't really care because Jesus thinks you need Jesus. And that's why each letter opens in the way it does. To the church in wherever. The words of Jesus. The words of him who holds the stars in his hands. And who walks among the lampstands. The words of the one who is the Lord of the church. The words of him who is the first and the last. 
The words of him and those words are like a sharp two-edged sword. They're like a weapon. The words of him whose eyes are like fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. The words of Jesus who holds in his hand the stars themselves, who possesses the mighty life-giving spirit. The words of the Holy One, the faithful witness, the one who is truth and the Amen. The one who holds the keys. And he says to the church in Laodicea, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness. The words of him who is the ruler, the origin, the source of all the universe. And when you have that description of Jesus and you you hear what John saw, you realize, wow, Jesus really is somebody I need to take very seriously. I can't mess around with Jesus. I can't dip in and out with him. I can't treat Jesus like maybe I treat the other people in my life who who I'm just indifferent to or who I mess around with or who I just, you know, take them, moan about them and just take them here and there and I'm not, you know, you can't treat Jesus like that, can you? When you see this description and we cannot demand anything greater than that which we are offered here. He's amazing. Why would we want anything other than Christ? Give me Christ or else I die. Now, John describes Jesus like that because that's exactly what John saw in chapter 1. And John's response to Jesus when he saw him like this in all his glory was to fall down as though dead. His legs went from underneath him. The, The breath was pressed out of his chest and he was on the floor because Jesus is awesome. He is truly awesome. So whatever problems you have, Whatever things you think you need, whatever we think we need as a church, this Jesus, this awesome Christ, is the one who is promised to be with us and who is with us. When you're at home with your kids and you're going mad this Christmas as they're poking over presents, this is the Jesus who is with you. If you're eating a meal on your own at night, single person, This is the Jesus who's with you. If you're fearful and you need to speak to a family member about Jesus, it's this Jesus who is here. And so as we face our problems, Jesus is here. This one, this awesome and glorious Lord. But let me tell you, he's not here just so that we can feel good feel reassured and have a nice time together. Jesus is with us for a specific purpose. And when John realizes this Jesus, he, he, he bursts out into a song of praise in chapter 1 verse 6. And this gives us the detail of what it is that Jesus has come to do for us. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom. Priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen that's his song that's what he says so it says that jesus doesn't come and walk among the churches just to strike a pose and make us feel good about ourselves he comes here to love us to cover over our sins to commission us into work for our heavenly father so that we may bring more glory to jesus that's what the verse is saying he's here to do we've got sins that need covering over We've got a job to do for the Father, and he's going to tell us about that. We've got this awesome and mighty Savior, and we need him like nothing else. If we truly get who we are and what Jesus is doing. And John, John can't even look at him. His face is shining like the sun. He's on the floor. But then Jesus, this mighty one, bends down to touch him on the shoulder. I love this about Jesus. He's awesome in his glory but his glory is a cruciform glory he is majestic he is frightening in his power but he's so compassionate that he reaches down to you in friendship and he's got a word for you don't be afraid john it is i don't be afraid so we see this jesus who loves and cares for his church like nothing else in all the universe. He lays down his life for his church. 
And you've heard this here if you've been here before. We love churches here. We love to hear about church and it drives us mad when people grumble about this church or any other church or speak about other organizations as if that's the place to be. No, Christ loves his church with a passion that causes him to, to bleed out and die for them. He loves his church. And this church in Laodicea, this church in Laodicea, this church is the church that Spurgeon said that, that, that of all of these seven churches is the one that for, for all time and all places is the one that we can most truly identify with most often. And this church in Laodicea is again introduced to Jesus. They, they get a picture of Jesus. And the vision of Jesus that this church gets is the biggest of all the churches. And that should clue us into something significant here. Jesus gives more of himself to Laodicea than he does to any of the other churches in this vision. Look at what he says about himself in verse 14. The words of Jesus, the words of the one who is the Amen. Now when I was studying this, I thought that's, a, that's an interesting phrase, the Amen, that's a strange name to be used so I thought well is there somewhere else in the Bible that uses our men as a name in that personal way and there was there was one place Isaiah 65 16 and it says God of truth it talks of God of truth truly truly and the Hebrew is just it just means God the amen God the amen who blesses the earth And the interesting thing about Isaiah 65 is that it tells us how it is that God will bless the land and bless the earth. Because in the very next verse it says, Behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. God the Amen is the God of new creation. Jesus is the beginning and the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, isn't he? Because he's the pioneer of the new creation. He's the firstborn from among the dead. He is the firstborn, the forerunner of the age to come. So when Jesus says the words of him who is the Amen, he's speaking about how he is the beginning and the source and the origin and the ruler of the old creation and the new creation. It's both. And it's incredible. The vision we get of Jesus here is massive. So he is the beginning and the source, the arche, the ruler over all the old creation. Everything has its being in Christ. It was created by him and for him and through him and in him. All things hold together. But in his resurrection, the one who is the head and ruler of the whole creation goes down into death and he comes out the other side. And now he's beginning something new. And this should tell us there's a whole new purpose and future for the creation in Jesus the head and ruler he is the cosmic christ he is the cosmic christ who brings life who brings form meaning and purpose to all things now and all things in the future you need jesus because he is this one he is the amen the faithful and true witness which means that everything jesus says and does is solid certain and true and you can Build your life on him. You can build your life on Jesus because he's risen from the dead. You are alive this morning because Jesus says so. You have breath because Jesus says you may have breath. You are sustained because he does. He sustains you. That's why you need Jesus. And he's shown us where the universe is headed. The universe is headed to new creation. And because of that, if you don't have Jesus, all you're left with is everlasting death. So this is a huge vision of Jesus that Laodicea is given. So we ask why? What is it that the cosmic Christ, the ruler over all creation, goes on to say about this church that he offers so much of himself to them? He says, I know your works. I know your works. I see it, verse 15. 
I see all you're doing. I see the programs you've got. I see the people you've got. I see the, the way you come in on time. I see the way you sing and read the scriptures. I know everything that's going on in your church. I know about that conversation you had. I know about the way you talk about those other people. I know the choices you're making as a church and as individuals. I know you. And the reaction what he feels when he sees the church in Laodicea. He says, I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. Would that you'd be one or the other. But because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Wow. That is strong stuff from Jesus, isn't it? And you think... You know, he's watching, he sees everything that goes on, he knows all the ins and outs, he knows all the details of it, and he knows what we've been doing, and he knows how long we've been Christians, and he knows how much we've given, he knows all of this, and he says, yeah, I see all of that, and you make me sick. You make me want to spew you out. You are disgusting to me. And you think, what on earth have they done at Laodicea to create that kind of reaction? What happened there? That when you lot get together, that's what Jesus wants to do. Your gatherings make me sick. And you think, well, the previous churches up the road in Pergamon, they've got sexual immorality going on and they don't get that reaction. They've got false teachers kicking around, spreading lies, and they don't get that reaction. Something much worse has happened in Laodicea. And you think, well, what's worse than that? And in Thyatira, it's the same. They've got problems with sexual immorality. People are sleeping around using pornography. They're utterly deluded about their spirituality. So much so that Jesus actually accuses them of worshipping other gods. But it's worse in Laodicea, it seems. In Sardis, they're dying out because they've been dining out on that reputation. In Ephesus, they're loveless, cold and moralistic. What has happened at Laodicea? What is worse than false teaching, sexual immorality, prideful name-making, idol worship, and cold-hearted moralism? It's this, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him. And eat with him and he with me. That is what's worse than moralism, sexual immorality, pride, idol worship. Jesus is outside this church. He's outside and he's knocking on the door. He's been expelled from their gatherings. The church thinks they're okay. This church thinks they can exist without Jesus but somewhere down the line somewhere down the line they've changed from being a church that started by Jesus and loved Jesus and uh, but but they've just now nah, we're bored with that now we're sick of all those sermons being told we need Jesus that we've got to keep him central and the main thing well we're not we don't want that we don't want that anymore and to anyone looking outside from, from the outside, they probably would look like an impressive church. They've got all these works going on. They seem busy, but the reality is they're trying to exist. They're trying to grow and serve and do church. And Jesus is just not there. He's just not present. And that is what makes him want to vomit. When he looks at this gathering in Laodicea, he looks at them. He knows he came for them so that he could cover over their sin with his blood and make them a people and gather them to himself and gather the people around the cross to serve the Father. He did this for them. He expended his life for them. And to all intents and purposes, they've turned around to Jesus and says, well, thanks for the assist. Now you can push off and let us do church our way. Church without Jesus. And it's sick. Listen to what they say. Listen to what the church says here in verse 17. For you say, I am rich. I have prospered. I need nothing. 
You know, we're so self-sufficient, we've done well, we've got everything we need, we've got all our resources, we don't really need Jesus. We've arrived as a church. What happened? We know it didn't start out this way for Laodicea because when Paul wrote his letter to Colossae, to the Colossian church, which is just down the road from Laodicea, he said, greet the brothers and sisters in Laodicea. He's encouraging them to have fellowship with the Laodiceans. Give them Christian greetings and, 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 you know, have fellowship with them. There's no warnings there. Stay away from those guys. They've expelled Jesus from the assembly. That's bad news. You definitely don't want to be... No, they're fine. He says, go and have fellowship. Somewhere down the line, they've got rid of Jesus. He's just not real to them anymore. Is Jesus real? Is Jesus real? They do church. There's a frenzy of activity, all these works, all these things to see, but there's no Jesus. There's no Jesus. And it makes Christ sick. Jesus says, you think you're self-sufficient. You think you've got all this. But actually, verse 17, you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. You have no idea. You don't even know how bad you are. And so with that strength of language and strength of feeling from Jesus about Laodicea, you think, well, what's he going to do? Is he going to wash his hands of them once and for all and send in an angel of death and terminate them? How dare you think you don't need me? Tear off the roof and smite them. He's outside banging on the door and you think, well, just boot it down and come in. And they'll all turn around and go, that's who was missing from our meetings. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't do any of that nonsense. He's not petty. He's not using his frightening, powerful, awesome glory to do that. No, he's a jilted lover, not a wife beater. And so he says, what does he do? He says, verse 18, I counsel you. I counsel you. I've got a word for you. That's all. You think, Jesus, go and sort them out. No, I've got a word for you. I've always got a word for you. I counsel you. And I come and I knock at the door, just gently trying to get through. I've got a word for you. And there's an allusion here to Isaiah 55, this word that he has for them. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Incredible words of grace he's got for this hypocritical church, isn't it? What a bridegroom. How much does he love his church? As I say, there's an allusion to Isaiah 55, which says this in verses 1 to 3. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy, eat. Come and buy bread and wine and milk without money, without price. Why do you spend your money on things which are not bread which, and labor for things which don't satisfy. Listen diligently, diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. And then he goes on to say in verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. So that is the word that Jesus has for the Laodiceans. <coughs> It's gospel, isn't it? It's a gentle gospel word. He wants to bring them back. He wants to save them. So he preaches the gospel to them personally from the other side of the door, but he's doing it gently as he knocks on the door to seek their attention. I want to counsel you. I've got a word for you. I've got something to say. Come and buy. You can know your thirst quench. You can have your hunger deeply satisfied. Just open the door. Open the door, let me in. And you can have all of that without money, without cost to yourself. We read, didn't we, in Isaiah 9, he'd be called Wonderful Counselor. 
He counsels them. He's a lover of his people and a saviour of them. And what a saviour he is. The reality for the church, any church really, this church, Laodicea, every church, is that we are, without Christ, poor, spiritually impoverished, naked and wretched and to be pitied. We're not the fantastic movers and shakers and spiritual dynamos that the Laodiceans thought they were. They were blind to the reality of what they actually were. That's the worst part. They're blind and wretched and naked. And there's nothing good about that, is there? Nakedness. I don't know if you ever have those anxiety dreams. Little boys get these all the time. Uh, I remember it well. And you get these anxiety dreams. You go to school or you go into the workplace or something. And, you know, everything's fine. And then all of a sudden you're like, <coughs> I've got nothing on. <laughs> Terrifying. The thought of nakedness like that. But that's what you are, Jesus says. Without me, you are naked and wretched. And if you can't see it, it's horrible. It's cruel. It's embarrassing. You should be ashamed of yourself. Are we ashamed of what we are? Naturally, in ourselves? Naked, blind, poor and wretched. Empty and lifeless. But Jesus says you can be something completely different. You can be rich beyond all measure. You can have gold. You can have true riches. If you open the door to Jesus, come and speak with me. Talk with me. Verse 20 goes on to say, I will. I'll come in and eat with you and fellowship with you. You with me, me with you. Not only that, I will grant you to sit with me on my throne. Can you imagine that? To sit with Jesus on his throne? That high and glorious throne in heaven? The fact that he's outside the door, knocking, speaking gently, even though Laodicea makes him feel sick, he's still there. That's how much he loves churches. Because verse 19, it says, those he loves, he reproves. Yes, he's on the outside, but he so loves what is on the inside. He loves the people. He loves you. He bled and died for you. He cares for all those who are inside, no matter what they do, no matter how awful they are and how sick they make him feel. He's not running away. He's not abandoning those for whom he has given that promise. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You may forsake me. You may kick me out of the meetings, but I'm on the outside and I'm knocking on that door and I'm going nowhere. Let me in. That's how much he loves you. He sees what's going on. He sees our lives. And no matter how cold and distant we feel, he's right there. Just call on his name. Do you feel distant from God this morning? Do you feel far away? Do you feel like he's outside? You're here, you've enjoyed the young people stuff, maybe singing the carols, I've enjoyed that, I like reading my Bible in church. You've been coming week in, week out, you've been mouthing stuff where you sit, but your heart is like stone, it is as hard as steel. You feel distant from Jesus. You maybe think, it's been so long, I can't possibly go and talk to the pastor or my home group leader or my friend and tell them that I'm cold and Jesus is not real to me. Imagine the shame. I've been here so long of confessing that I feel distant. No, friend, the shame is in your nakedness if you're not clothed. If you're not crying out, there's the shame. He's at the door. He's not far from you at all and he's knocking. And he wants to counsel you. Do you hear his voice? Because he's calling your name. Maybe you go through the week and the only time you pray is when you come to church. The only time you read your Bible is when it's up on the screen. 
You've basically gone through your week saying, Jesus, I don't actually need you. But you know you're so spiritually dry and you're in that cycle. It's so hard to get out of. Well, this morning Jesus comes and he says, I'm here to slake your thirst. I'm here to satisfy your hunger. To cover over your shame, your nakedness. To open your eyes to what you are and who I am. Just open the door. Just open the door. If you're not a Christian here this morning, it's great that you are here. And you're thinking, maybe I'm missing something in my life. I'm worried about the future. I'm worried about heaven and hell. And I, know, I don't know all that's going on in the world. And I, I think, God, you must be there. And I just don't know. And you feel dry and hungry and lifeless. Jesus says, call out to me. You've seen how big I am. He's made that clear. He can deal with your life. He can deal with your sin. He can deal with all that is going on in your life. I can satisfy your hunger. I can satisfy that thirst where you've been looking elsewhere to satisfy it. I'm here for that. Whatever it is that you did in the past that you feel so shamed by or whatever anyone did to you. He says, I'm here and I will robe you in white, pure garments to cover over All that you are, all that you think you are, that is what he is here to do. He knows everything about us, but he still wants to eat with us and have fellowship with you. Even this stinking hypocritical church of Laodicea, he sticks around. He's the faithful one. He's not going to run out on you like other people in your life have done. He'll stick around for you. You can trust in Jesus. If you don't trust him, don't go this morning without coming to Jesus and calling out to him. Call on the name of the Lord while he may be found. He's right here. He's knocking at the door. He's right here. He's amongst us. He can be found here. Please come to Jesus today. And brothers and sisters of the church, we need to ask the question, have we been self-sufficient? Do we think we've got riches and that we're okay? Do we know that we need Jesus? Is Jesus the person that you think of the, the second you wake up in the morning, the last person you think of at night? Do you rely on Jesus for everything? Students, college students, young people, do you, when you go out there and and you know that you're a Christian and your friends do and it feels hard at times and are you crying out to Jesus in those moments? I need you, Jesus. I need you right now. When you go to work, you take each day as it comes, you're plodding along in the workplace and, and, and God has given you this role, this job to do so that you can bring glory to Jesus. And you think, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to bring attention to myself and let people know I'm a Christian. I just want to keep my head down. But he is your life and breath and the origin and source of all things. You cannot do without him. Jesus says, I can restore whatever is broken. I've got this. I'm big enough to do that. Don't think you're too busy. Don't think you're too compromised too far gone, too hypocritical to cry out to Jesus. That's the amazing news that he has for us today in this passage. Even the Laodiceans, there was grace for them. So here's the thing. We know we need to have Jesus. We know that that, that we have to have him central to everything we do. But what does it actually look like for a church to have Jesus at the centre? What does it look like when a church knows that it is naked, wretched, poor, blind, shameful? What do we do when we know we've got nothing? When we, we recognize who we are and you've had your eyes open to that awful reality. Well, you know that Jesus is the only thing you could possibly have or possibly want. But what does it look like for a church to cry out to Christ. What does it look like for a gathered people? That's what a church is. That's what it means. A gathered people. 
What does it look like when we utterly depend on Christ? Well, there can be no room for pride, can there? Prideful talk. Nobody can wave their certificate about and wave their qualifications at us and speak about how long they've been a Christian. It's like, don't draw attention to yourself if you're naked. Point to Jesus. Point to Jesus. If you know who you are, you'll point to Christ. If we truly understand who and what we are, then what's it going to look like at the prayer meeting? If we know that we are wretched and naked and poor, if we know that we've got nothing without Christ, we're going to cry out to him. We're going to cry out to him. And, 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 and we need his help for everything we do, for every ministry, for every area of church life, for everything we're going to do at Christmas. If we're not crying out to Christ for help, for life, for him to pour out that spirit that he possesses beyond measure, then it's all a waste of time. If we know what we are, we will be on our knees in prayer. We think about the people. Think about your brother and sister. You know what's going on in some of their lives. You cannot do a thing to reverse the advance of cancer. You cannot do a thing to see your wife, husband, children, neighbours saved. I can't do that. You need to cry out to Jesus. Come to the prayer meetings. Won't you be there this Wednesday at 7 a.m., 1 p.m., 7.30? Bowing before Jesus, pleading with him to help and to change our lives, our town, to save, to, to give the elders of this church wisdom and strength because we haven't got it unless we ask and to make the preaching powerful and, and, and we need to call out to God that it's not boring, that God would use the words that are said And if we don't want to pray, if we arrange our weeks and we know we could be here, but we choose not to be, right there is the sign and token that you're showing Jesus the door. We need to ask, is there any area of church life, any aspect of life in the church where we're not truly dependent and reliant On our Lord Jesus Christ. Pleading for help. Are we self-sufficient? Are we crying out to him for everything we need? Many of you will know that for the last goodness knows how many years. At the end of every financial year the church has posted a loss. A loss. But for years and years running because there's been a reserve. We've just said okay we can cope let's move on have we been self-sufficient well brothers and sisters we can't do that anymore for a number of reasons firstly it's not healthy we need to be dependent utterly dependent on our knees secondly we can't keep doing that because we're spending the money the flat the toilets the rose window, the carpets, the cushions and training men for ministry. That's gospel investment and that's good. But the best thing about that expenditure is it means we must now be on our knees in prayer. Dependent on Christ for everything. Not self-sufficient. Are we a people that knows that we cannot live, breathe or do a thing for a second without Jesus? We need to invite him. Fellowship. Invite him to fellowship with us. And he will eat with us. He will give us life. He will give us spiritual vigor. He will give us our daily bread. He might not give us everything we want, but he'll give us everything we need. Anyone who's dreading the week ahead, any conversation that you know you're going to have to have that you're dreading, you don't want to have to have that conversation, cry out to God. Cry out to Jesus for help. Anyone who's got work that needs to be handed in, anyone who's got deadlines to meet, 
cry out to Jesus, the one who is this mighty lion whose face shines like the sun, who has all the resources of the universe, who can help you, who is the terrifying faithful witness whose feet are like burnished bronze, the ruler of the kings of the earth, king of kings, lord of lords, yet who is also the one who is meek and merciful, who stoops with compassion and love to you, and he's reaching out in friendship. I have a word for you. I want to counsel you. Don't be afraid, John. I am the first and the last. He's the lion and he's the lamb who bled and died for you to cover over all of your sin and nakedness and shame. You need Jesus. Every single one of you, whether you're a believer or not, you must have Jesus in everything you do. He loves his church. He so loves his church that no matter what we've got right, no matter what we've got wrong, no matter what changes may or may not be coming in the next couple of years, we can know for absolute certainty that if we've got Jesus, we will overcome. We can face anything only if we have Jesus. Do you know him? And do you know you need him? Because Jesus thinks you do. Amen.